listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Hey, 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 Sarah McKenzie here, and well, surprise, (laughs) I bet you weren't expecting to find a new Read Aloud Revival podcast yet, were you? The official season nine of the Read Aloud Revival podcast doesn't start until mid-August, but I missed you all, so I thought I'd slip into your earbuds. This is a bonus episode for you to enjoy before you launch into our new school year. I think it's an important topic to think about before that new school year rolls in, and I'm really excited to chat about it with you. I didn't want to wait until the school year had started to have this conversation. Many of you took a survey recently at the Read Aloud Revival, and you answered loud and clear. One thing you very much want are more podcast episodes. Well, you know I love to please, right? (laughs) So I thought I'd come chat to you today so we can talk about the most important job we all have when it comes to our kids and books. It's probably not what you think it is. A whole lot of us get this completely and utterly wrong. Schools do it, teachers do it, moms do it. Well-meaning adults make this epic mistake in the education of our children. We make teaching a child to read our top priority. When it comes to our kids and books, our top priority is not to teach our children to read. It's not to help them decode words on the page, it's not to help them learn their phonics, and it's not to help bolster their reading comprehension. It's none of those things. Mark Twain wrote, A man who does not read has no advantage over the man who cannot read. And the same thing can be said for children. Our first and foremost job in the education of our children, then, is to nurture a love for reading. We can pretty much shelf everything else until we're nailing that. Here's why. If you focus primarily on teaching your kids how to read, you will very likely have kids who do indeed know how to read. In fact, I feel fairly confident in assuring that no matter where your child is on his or her learning to read struggle, he or she will very likely emerge a reader before leaving your home. But do you want kids who read because they can or kids who read because they love to, kids who read because they can't imagine life without stories. A child who's been bribed, cajoled, or pressured to read doesn't delight in it. When he's forced to read a book and answer comprehension questions about it, or take, I don't know, maybe an accelerated reader quiz on it, (laughs) or write a book report about it, he learns something very, very clearly. He learns that reading is something you have to do for school. Reading is something you need to get out of the way. Check it off your list, get it done with already. So even if he can read because someone has taught him, he won't do it for fun. He won't delight in it. He won't see books as one of life's sweetest delights. When you focus on nurturing your child's love of stories first and foremost, even above teaching him how to read, you end up with a child who can read and a child who loves to as well. You get both. You may not get the first part on your own timetable, (laughs) but you'll get it on your child's unique timetable. And he'll have an insatiable appetite for stories as well, which is worth its weight in gold. A child with an insatiable appetite for stories will learn to read, although it might not happen this week. You've got to be patient. But he or she will learn to read. And he or she will read then, even if it doesn't come as a mandate from you, the mom, or the teacher. Actually, he or she will read especially because it doesn't come from the mom or the teacher. When it comes to language arts, everything follows nurturing that initial love. First, we want kids who love stories. Everything else, the phonics, comprehension, analysis, writing, all of it follows that love. I find it terribly tragic when I hear that a child has been reading voraciously in school for assignments, you know, the best classics or poets or best novels of all time, if that child doesn't also leave school with an overpowering love of books. 
So prioritize your child's love of literature above everything else, even if it means your kids aren't reading the same impressive books your kids' friends are, even if it means they read less than your kids' friends are or have less to show for it. In his 1965 anthology, A Father Reads to His Children, Orville Prescott wrote, Few children learn to love books by themselves. Someone has to lure them into the wonderful written word. Someone has to lead the way. So how do we do that? How do we help our children fall head over heels for the wonderful written word? You're the perfect person for this task. If you care deeply about a young person in your life and the way he or she interacts with the world, you're just the right person to inspire that love of reading. First, understand that a love of reading can't be forced, coerced, or goaded. True love must blossom on its own. Think about real adult readers, you know, the kind who read for pleasure in their free time of their own free will. They read what brings them joy. Isn't that the goal for our children that they will someday become real adult readers? Today, I want to give you three quick ideas you can put into practice right away to help nurture your child's love of reading. We're going to run through these pretty quickly because they're not things that are going to take a lot of your time or energy. They're simple. You know me, I'm a busy mama of six. I always think simple is best. So these are three ideas that I think you could put into practice here at the end of summer um, to help nurture that love of reading in your kids and hopefully remember to reorient your own priorities as you're thinking about reading in your kids in the new school year so you aren't tempted to you know, prioritize something else above that love of reading. So the first thing I think that is really helpful is if we consider scheduling time, not titles. What I mean is dictate less of what your child reads. Instead of assigning particular books, just give them the time and space they need to read. We live in a really loud, distracting world, the most, you know, the loudest, most distracting generation ever. And our kids really need time and space that has been set aside for them specially to read. But if we focus on just scheduling that time and making that happen for our kids every day, rather than insisting that they read our particular list of titles, (laughs) I think we'll see a lot of good things happen. So we can do this by blocking off a half an hour or maybe an hour in the day when the only option is one of two things. You know, you guys can do anything you want as long as it's resting on your bed or reading. (laughs) No screens, um, you know, No other distractions, no iPhones, no iPads, no video games. You can rest on your bed or you can read. What I have found when I've done this with my kids is that they, rather than them thinking this is a punishment, they delight in it. They need a little bit of help making the time and space to read. I mean, I know as an adult, I have a hard time sometimes picking up my book and reading when I have the option of scrolling through Facebook or dinking around on my phone, even though I see myself as a reader and I want to be a voracious reader. So I think it's a great gift we can give to our children as parents when we say, hey, I'm going to block this time off for you and give you the time and space to read. Now, no grimacing when you find them reading an entire stack of Calvin and Hobbes or Garfield (laughs) or even, you know, those dreadful Disney fairy books or something else (laughs) that totally gets on your nerves. As long as it fits into your normal, you know, this is appropriate fair for children and it's not morally damaging, then just let them read what they want during that time of day. Kids who love to read read more often. And developing good taste for quality books takes time to mature. So let that happen without forcing it, without worrying that it's not happening now. Um, And help your child figure out that that reading hour is the very best hour of the day. You do that by allowing that to be a completely delightful, wonderful time of day. Not where you're saying, go read this particular classic or this particular book that I want you to read, but rather I'm going to guard this time and space for you and you can read whatever lights you up. So schedule the time, but not the titles for your child. The second tip is to dig out a childhood favorite and read that aloud. Now, I mean a childhood favorite from your childhood. You know, so often we feel the need to read the best books to our kids, right? So we pick up classics like Wind in the Willows or something, and maybe whatever we saw someone post on their Instagram feed. There's nothing wrong with that, but if your kids haven't seen you light up with complete and utter delight while reading aloud lately, then you need to pick something that you will completely light up reading. I I don't care if it's Babysitter's Club or Sweet Valley High. Seriously, what did you love reading as a child? 
pick one up and read that. Now, if you really don't want to read something from that you read as a child, let's say you actually have a moral objection to the Babysitter's Club, <laughs> then you need to pick up something that is otherwise completely enjoyable to read. I've got a list of books for you to choose from. You can pick pretty much anything off that list and have a good chance of enjoying it. We spent a lot of time and care uh, curating that list to make sure the books on that list were almost guaranteed wins. You can grab that list for free at rarbooklist.com and you'll be in good hands with those book recommendations. So a few quick recommendations uh, just off the top of my head. You want to go for something short with delightful characters and an engaging plot because if you're trying to demonstrate enjoyment, then you want this to be a quick win. You don't you're not slogging through anything. So um, a couple that come to mind right off the bat are Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. Any books in that series are completely fun. Um, Pippi Longstocking is another one that's completely enjoyable. Anything by Edward Eager, like Half Magic, that whole series is fantastic. Those are all quick wins that just popped into my mind right now. So here's the thing when it comes to picking a childhood favorite and just digging in. Just commit to 10 minutes a day until you're done reading. Like start today, really, 10 minutes a day. So if you miss a day or you miss three days, don't beat yourself up. I see so many people who want to do something of a reading streak and say, you know, I want to read every single day for this many days in a row and they get so discouraged when they can't make it happen. But we're actually living real life and there's a lot of other things (laughs) that we have to tend to. Um, The read aloud police, they're not going to come banging on your door, I promise. (laughs) Actually, the read aloud police probably don't get reading aloud in every day either. (laughs) (laughs) So just shoot for 10 minutes a day because I'm telling you, 10 minutes a day is completely manageable for for most of us and it adds up to a tremendous amount of reading over time. You can read a book pretty quickly by just tackling it in 10 minute chunks and making that that start really low barrier to entry, you know, like really low energy saying, I I can't sit in here and read for 30 minutes, but I can read for 10 will make it much more likely that you'll read more often. So number one, schedule time, not titles. And number two, choose something from your childhood and read that. Number three is consider giving your kids a book allowance. I saw this idea first in the comments of the Read Aloud Revival Facebook page, and I was immediately taken with it. I mean, we demonstrate that things have value when we spend our money on them, right? And what better way to help our kids get into the habit of valuing books than adding to their personal libraries and growing their personal libraries? We're just now enforcing this idea brand new in our home. My kids are going nuts for it. Um, They don't really need to love books more than they already do, but I loved this idea too much not to implement it. So our kids are getting a $15 monthly book allowance that they can spend on any books they want, of course, within our normal guidelines. Um, But you don't even have to go that big. You could even just give your kids, say, $5 and then take them to a used bookshop or even three bucks and take them to thrift stores if you'd like. You can get some good books for not very expensive at thrift stores. Um, I kind of hate taking my toddler twins out to stores of any kind. (laughs) So we made ours $15 a month and we're doing our book shopping online. But if this idea appeals to you, get creative with how you could fit it into your particular family circumstances. Giving your kids a book allowance will mean that over time they will grow their personal library and they will develop a special fondness for books that they own and that are on their own shelves. Just think from yourself. Think about your own childhood. If you had books on your own shelf or books of your very own that you probably have a special fondness for those and we want to give our kids that as well. So again, tip number one was schedule time, not titles. Tip number two is just pick something from your childhood and read that. And number three is consider giving your book, your kids, a book allowance. Now, if you try any of these and you post about it to social media, use the Read Aloud Revival hashtag because I want to hear about it. And I'm constantly prowling that hashtag to see what all of you wonderful people are up to. So let's do this. Let's inspire our kids to fall in love with books. Let's remember as we launch into a whole new school year that the most important part of the reading recipe for our kids is not teaching them to decode or teaching them to comprehend. It's teaching them that loves are a delightful pleasure. Every other problem we could possibly run into regarding books and reading would be made easier if we did this first if we kept this the first thing, if we nurtured a deep and abiding love of the reading life in each of our kids.
Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. Hi, my name is Noah. I'm five years old and I live in Virginia. My favorite author is Graham Bates. Here's some of the books he writed. The Watering Hole, and Amelia, was Sign of the Seahorse, Jungle Rump, and Maya. What do you like so much about his books? I like that he hides thing on, things on every page. Are they mysteries? Yes, they're yeah. all mysteries. And adventures? Uh-huh. Is he a great artist? Yes. Which of those books is your favorite? I like Sign of the Seahorse. Do you think other boys and girls would like those books? Yes. Hi, my name is Allison. I am 10 years old and I live in San Diego, California. My favorite book is The Rise and Fall of Mount Majestic by Jennifer Trafton because Persimmon and Warville have to stop a giant from waking up under their beautiful Mount Majestic. Hi, my name is Cassidy. I am eight years old and I live in San Diego, California. My favorite series are the Imagination Station books by Adventures in Odyssey. I like them because they go in different vacation, no, not vacations, like adventures together in this thing called the Imagination Station. Most of the adventures that they go on are based on true stories. Hi, I'm Clara. I'm um, four and a half. I um, will be turning five on Monday. My favorite book is The Trumpet of the Swan because I like it because it um, has Dad um, give out so many speeches. He's really funny. Hi, my name is Emma Elizabeth. I'm seven. I live from Virginia. My favorite book is Ramona. My favorite book, why my favorite book is Ramona um, is because her family is sort of like me. She's like me. She does a lot of things that I do, and that's why I like the book called Ramona. Hi, my name is Ireland. I live in Hampton, Virginia. I'm 14 years old, and my favorite book series is um, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, and I like it because it's adventurous and funny. Hello, my name is Trammell Thompson. I'm 11 and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. My favorite read aloud is James Harriet's Treasury for Children, which I read to my sisters. It's my favorite because I love the stories and the pictures keep my sisters interested. My name is Isley. I live in um, California. I'm four and um, I just love that my mom reads me Ramona and her father. And I just love the sheep part because I just love it because as she has, she dressed up and she got married and um, she still got to be um, Ramona and she got to wear her PJs like a sheep. Thank you, kids. Always fantastic. Um, hey, you know what? Season 9 of the Read Aloud Revival podcast starts August 22nd. That's coming up pretty soon. We have some really fantastic episodes to share with you. I'm so excited. We're kicking off Season 9 with a conversation with Rebecca Bellingham. If you've been on the Read Aloud Revival Facebook page, you know I love sharing her TEDx talk on why we should all be reading aloud to children. Her conversation is not going to disappoint. So excited to kick off our next season with that. If your kids would love to be featured on the Read Aloud Revival, head to readaloudrevival.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and you'll find out exactly how to record that message. It's super simple. You can coach your child right through, and we love to hear what your kids are reading and loving. 
If you have not seen the Andrew Clements Author Access event, we have made for a limited time the Read Aloud Revival Author Access event with Andrew Clements free. And you know what? We have gotten some incredible feedback from kids who have come to that event saying that Andrew Clements was epically awesome or they were totally inspired. Really, the man blew me away during our event. If you haven't gotten a seat to that yet, you can get it free. All you need to do is head to the show notes for this episode and you'll be able to grab it. So head to readaloudrevival.com and then look for this bonus episode in season eight. You'll be able to find exactly where to go to grab your free access to the Andrew Clements Author Access event. We talked about Frindle and some of his other books. He was incredible, totally inspiring. I think you're going to love it. And I cannot wait to share with you the authors that we are lining up for two, the rest of 2016. And definitely 2017 is going to knock your socks off. Um, we've gotten some pretty big name authors to sign for us and come on to the Read Loud Revival live in membership. Talk to your kids, answer their questions. We'll be revealing those names of authors very, very soon. I can hardly wait to share them with you. Again, season nine will start August 22nd. I will see you then. But until then, friends, go build your family culture around books. 